you ever read one of those misleading headlines where you know the author, the writer, the editor, they meant something, they meant one thing, but it just came out all wrong and maybe after the fact they realized it was communicating something totally different? Some misleading, misleading headlines. Police begin campaign to run down jaywalkers. Isn't that great? That's a misleading headline right there. Just run them down. That's what we'll do. Miners refuse to work after death. Well, that one seems to make sense, doesn't it? Or how about this one? Juvenile court to try shooting defendants. Or they try shooting defendants. However you read it there. Misleading headlines. Red tape holds up new bridges. That may be the case, especially uh, in Oklahoma. Or man struck by lightning faces battery charge. Isn't that great? Misleading headlines. New study of obesity looks for larger test group. You would think somebody would catch that at some point. A larger test group. Or this one, kids make nutritious snacks. Oh yeah, that tastes like chicken. Tastes like chicken. Or this one here, typhoon rips through cemetery, hundreds dead. Misleading headlines. They were intended to read one way, but... When you look at them, because of the way they're written, they can be misread. They can be misread in some other way. And you know what? We're going to talk today in our our sermon about how it's easy to misread Jesus. Uh, In fact, an entire Jewish religious system is going to misread the, the very thing that God is sending, the very person that God is sending to them. In fact, God had warned them. God had prepared them. God had sent prophet after prophet telling them about his coming. Yet, they're still going to miss Jesus. They still are going to misread all of the Old Testament pointing to Jesus. And yet, somehow, an entire group of people are going to misread him. I want to welcome you back to our series. It's called The Story, where we've just been walking through the chronological timeline, the major stories of the Bible from beginning and We're going to read it all the way through the end. We're in chapter 24, and uh, so hopefully at some point you've read through chapter 24. It's a a big uh, chapter. There's lots of things. In fact, it could be several series of sermons just on what we read in chapter 24. But we're getting to that point where we're reading through and we're seeing that Jesus is is the hero of the story. Jesus is stepping into the story. In fact, we're in the third week now talking about the life of Jesus, and we're going to talk today about how he is no ordinary man. We talked back in the Old Testament about the time of David, about how sometimes we put God in a box, how sometimes we we put God into something where we limit his capabilities, or we think we do, in our minds, our perception, and so we we talked about not putting God in a box, but the problem is we live in a world of boxes. We like boxes because boxes keep things neat and they keep things organized and they keep things contained. And so we make a box like beauty and we put things in it like skinny and we put toned and maybe tan and we hold that up and go, this is what beauty is. It's our box or we create a box and we call it success and we put things like money and stocks and we put nice house and we put 2.5 kids, and we put all those things into that success box, and we hold it up, and we go, this is what success is. And we do the same thing in the church, don't we? We make a box, and we call it Christian, and depending on where you grew up and what church you went to and all of that, then we have this box that we put certain things into because we can see that Christians are, you know, they're nice people, and Christians, they go to church. We put that in the box, and Christians, they don't cuss, and they don't drink, or whatever we decide that we're going to put in that box, and that's kind of our understanding, our definition. We do it with worship. Depending on what church you go to, depending on how you grew up, this is our worship box and we put our preferences and we put our styles in there and we say this is what worship is. And we sure do the same thing with Jesus. Depending on where you grew up and what you understand and how much you've read and how much you've talked to Jesus, we put him in a box. And when you put Jesus in a box, it's easy to miss him. For one thing, because Jesus doesn't stay in boxes. 
In fact, Jesus has this capacity for always getting out of boxes. He is never staying where you put him. I mean, think about all the times of Jesus when he was supposed to be somewhere. He was in the crowd and then he was gone. Or Jesus was supposed to be in the boat and he's out on the water. Or he was supposed to be in a tomb and he had risen Jesus appears in places where you never thought he would be, yet he's missing in the very places that he's expected. You remember at age 12, Jesus was with his parents. They were in Jerusalem. They were attending a major uh, a festival uh, there, a major holiday. And, and in the midst of all the crowd and hurry and shopping and leaving, his parents get halfway home and realize Jesus isn't there. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. Where was he? Well, they had to go all the way back to Jerusalem and found him in the temple teaching the teachers. Jesus wasn't where he was supposed to be. Uh, that's the way that he always did things. Lazarus' sisters, send word to Jesus. Your friend Lazarus, our brother, he's sick. We need you here. And Jesus stayed where he was for another couple of days and didn't show up until Lazarus had already died. It wasn't where he was supposed to be, where the people had boxed him in at. His, his followers expected him to take up his throne. Jesus instead took up a cross. Because Jesus doesn't do boxes well. In fact, over and over again through his 33 years of ministry, what people tried to do was they tried to pigeonhole Jesus. Throughout his ministry, throughout his life, that's what he tried to do. And you know what pigeonhole means. It means to place or file in a small compartment or recess, to classify mentally or categorize simplistically. It's just to put somebody in a box, to pigeonhole them, to say, this is where you're to stay, and this is what you can do, and this is where you can be. The problem is that when you do that, you, Jesus doesn't stay in a box. Jesus is not limited. Jesus is not containable. Jesus is not manageable. You cannot put him in a box. And the problem is we live in a Jesus-saturated culture. I mean, we can look around and see Jesus everywhere. We can read Jesus storybooks and we can listen to music about Jesus and the car radio. We can, we, we, we can see Jesus we, dolls, our kids play with them, and maybe you've got a Jesus bumper sticker on your car. And we've got all kinds of things that represent Jesus. Our world is saturated with it. You can watch the sports news and some athlete at some point in time is going to give the credit to Jesus for the victory in some ball game at some point. And so if we're not careful... Jesus for us can become so predictable, something that we're so accustomed to, we think we know so much about him, we've been to so many Sunday school classes, we've heard so many sermons, we've read so many books, that Jesus for us sometimes just gets a yawn. We know him. We've got our little box that contains Jesus. In fact, we think we know him so much a few years ago, somebody put a campaign together, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Now, that's, I understand, uh, a, a pretty good slogan and cause for us to think about our actions. But on the other hand, it's a little arrogant for us to think that we would know what Jesus would do. I mean, if you were walking around in first century Palestine with Jesus himself, you would never, ever think that you could determine what Jesus was going to do next because, because he was unmanageable, he was uncontrollable. You never knew what was going to take place. You never knew what he would say. If you read through the Gospels, you don't know what's coming up next. If you read it with fresh eyes like you've never read it before, you don't know what he's going to do. You don't know what Jesus is going to say. You start reading it and you go, he did what? He said what? what? You just wonder all the time. Jesus, Jesus' life on earth, as we read it in the Gospels, was so ordinary, unordinary. It was so unexpected. In fact, it just sometimes seems so random. We know it wasn't, but that's what Jesus did. He could not be boxed. In fact, we could talk 
and preach a whole series of sermons on Jesus' associations and how they were out of the box. The people that Jesus ran around with, the people that Jesus associated with, the people that Jesus sat down with, the people that Jesus talked with. I mean, we talked about Jesus' calling of his disciples last week in the beginning of his ministry. I mean, he called unschooled fishermen, uh, people that, 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 uh, that were just ordinary people. Then he called a tax collector called a tax collector to, to follow him. Uh, for, for a Jew, for a good Jew, that was a traitor. A tax collector was someone that was a traitor that had teamed up with the Roman uh, government and they were in as much a thief to other people. Now, you had a tax collector on one side and we're also told that, that, that there was a Jewish zealot. Uh, for, in, in our terms, that would be an extremist. This would be somebody that was a, 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 an extremist. And you look at that and you're like, Jesus, how could you have both? How could you have both of those? And what Jesus is reminding us all along, even with his associations, is my kingdom is here and it's different. It's different than anything else. How could you have people from polar political opposites come together and be a part of the same thing? It doesn't happen when you box Jesus in. But Jesus says, my kingdom is completely different. And the people that followed him looked like that. And the people that, he, that, that he, he engaged, like a guy named Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector. Again, hated, thought to be a thief, robbing people. Literally, he ripped people off, overcharged them for the taxes that they owed. Zacchaeus invited him to a party. That's what Jesus did. He went, he went to parties. And somehow we've kind of sanitized those in the Bible. You know, these were probably like chip and dip and crackers and those kinds of things. But they were like parties in any era, in any culture. Jesus, Jesus was there. Jesus, I know you're not going to like this, some of you, Jesus bartended at a wedding. That's, that's what Jesus did. He went to parties. He hung out with people that, that we would never dream that he would. He, he walked around with prostitutes. He was compassionate to adulterers. He touched lepers. Those were the sorts that Jesus ran around with. And he got criticized because of it. Matthew eleven nineteen, 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, here's a glutton and a drunkard. A friend of a tax collector and sinners. They looked at Jesus and they tried to put him in a box and said, this is what good people do. This is what ordinary religious people do. And Jesus says, I'm not going to be a part of it. My kingdom has come and my kingdom is different. It wasn't just with his associations though. Jesus' actions were out of the box. In fact, if, if, if you read through and read it with a fresh perspective, you read about it and Jesus' actions are often off the wall. They're, they're completely unexpected. You, you would not think that he would do that next. If you didn't know better, you would think it was quirky. You would think eccentric. You would think he was some kind of strange guy just in the things that he did. I mean, Jesus is on a mission, but he let himself get interrupted all the time. People came to get his attention. People came to get him to do things. He got interrupted. And you know what took precedent more often than not? It was... The little children, the people that really had no value in first century Palestine, Jesus is the one that elevated their status. Women, children, Jesus took note of those people and paid attention to them. It was the forgotten and the needy. They took precedent over the prestigious and the important. The people who were caught in sin are the ones that he had the most compassion for. And the people who were seemingly trying to do the right things, those are the ones that he was often angry at and yelled at. And then he did strange things like this when crowds of people would gather around him chanting, Jesus, Jesus. He would slip off and go be by himself. Now, that just doesn't make sense to us. It doesn't fit in our box. In fact, one time when Jesus is walking through a crowd, he does something odd. He stops and he, and he freaks out in a way and says, somebody touched me. Who touched me? And his disciples are going, are you kidding me, Jesus? There's people everywhere touching you. Jesus' actions were so out of the box, so different than what people would have thought or imagined. It wasn't just the, the things that he did, though. There were specific miracles that he performed that were completely out of the box. We're told about a time that, 
that, that Jesus uh, uh, caused a, uh, a blind person to see. And we're told about times when he took uh, lame limbs and he made them work and he made them to move and he made them to walk. He, he, he caused leprous skin to be cleaned. He, he caused dead people to come to life. One time when Jesus was with his disciples and crowds had followed him all day long listening to him teach, somebody said, Jesus, we better let these folks go and go home because we don't have food for them. And Jesus says, no, you feed them. And they start looking around and the most that they can gather is a little boy's lunch that was just five loaves of bread and two little fish. It wasn't going to be enough. In fact, there's always a box maker in the crowd and in this case it was... Jesus' disciple, Philip. Philip told Jesus, hey, Jesus, I've done some calculations here, and if we were to feed all these people even just one bite, it would take eight months' wages. Let's put Jesus in a box. Jesus instead took that little boy's lunch, he blessed it and started handing it out, and everyone had their fill, so much so that there were baskets and baskets remaining. Thousands and thousands of people fed from just a little boy's lunch, because Jesus performed this miracle. One day he sh showed up in the middle of the, the Sea of Galilee. His disciples are awakened by him. He's walking on water. Because he is not bound. He is not boxed in by elements, by, by natural laws. He calmed the storm. Peace be still. And the waves immediately quit. The winds immediately calm. And Jesus' message through his actions is, my kingdom is here, and it's going to be completely different. Different than anybody ever expected. His actions out of the box. But we have to notice, too, that his teaching was out of the box. In fact, a lot of what we read in chapter 24, the story was about Jesus' teaching, and it was completely different than what anyone had ever heard before. It was completely different in the ways that he taught because they were used to Jewish rabbis and teachers going through and listing off checklists, do's and don'ts. These are the things. Let's get it right. Let's memorize these things. Let's work through it one more time. Let's go through the list. Everybody got it. That was the kind of teaching that they were used to. Jesus taught in a completely different way. Jesus used humor in his teaching. Sometimes we even miss it. He used hyperbole, which is a, a form of exaggeration to express humor. And he did it one time, you remember, when he says, why is it that you look and see that speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and you're forgetting about the plank in your own eye? We hear that teaching and we go, oh, that's, that's good, that's, that's profound. But when somebody heard that in Jesus' day, they bust out laughing. Because it was such an exaggeration for them. They, they, they weren't stuck in that being a, a teaching of Jesus. It was so new to them. It was funny to them. That exaggeration of a speck when all along I've got a plank in my own eye. It was humorous. Jesus used that. And he used stories. And he used parables. And he used everyday things to connect with people in some kind of way and tell them about the kingdom. Jesus told a parable about a sower who went out and sowed seeds. And Jesus related to that to his kingdom that was come. He said that sower sowed these seeds and sometimes they fell on the path and birds picked them up and carried it away and there was no harvest there. And sometimes they fell on rocky soil and they, they sprang up but they, they couldn't have deep roots. And so while they engaged partially, they would never live to harvest. And there were some that got distracted because they fell in the, the thorny soil and the weeds choked them, the distractions of life, Jesus said. And then there were some that fell on good soil. Jesus told this story about his kingdom and about receptivity to his kingdom. That that only about a fourth of the people, according to that parable, we're not gonna we're not gonna make that into something that Jesus says that he's not saying, but uh, you look at the parable, one-fourth respond. That's what Jesus, Jesus talked about his kingdom, and, and, and it was such a different way. He, he told the story about some lost things, a lost coin, and, and, and uh, he talked about a lost sheep. And lastly, he told a story in Luke 15 about a lost son, the 
prodigal son. We know that story. And Jesus told those stories to talk about how valuable lost things were to those that loved them. Explaining uh, God's heart and God's desire. The, the epitome of the story. God's pursuit of lost things. His people, his prized creation. Jesus told a parable one time about a good Samaritan in a conversation with somebody about the most important commandments. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And somebody said, who's my neighbor? And Jesus told about a a person who was walking down and gets beaten and robbed. And who is it that shows compassion? Who is it that is this neighbor? It was the good Samaritan. Jesus told stories to help people understand about his kingdom and about what it, what it looked like. Jesus was completely different in the way that he taught and he was completely different in what he taught. I mean, think about some of the things that you read there in chapter 24, like the Beatitudes. Every one of them starts out with blessed, happy. Happy are those who are poor in spirit. Who in the world would ever teach something like that? Happy are the poor. Happy are those that mourn. Happy are the meek and other people just run over the top of them. Happy are the persecuted. I mean, it was completely revolutionary teaching. No one was teaching anything like that in Jesus' day. And Jesus comes along and teaches things that they had never heard before. Jesus says, this is what kingdom citizens, people in my kingdom, this is the way they act. This is what they do. This is how they they do things. And it was completely revolutionary. His teaching was something that people had never, never heard before, out of the box. In fact, look at the result. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had, had authority and not as teachers of the law. They recognized that Jesus was different. And they soaked in and they listened to what he had to say. You know, when you think about it, the same is true today of Jesus' teaching. So much of it goes completely against common sense to us. Things that we look at and go, we would never just do that automatically. We would never think of it that way. It's completely countercultural. It's completely opposite. It goes against everything that seems right to us. And unfortunately, just like the Jews, we want both. We want to listen to Jesus, but we want to do things that make sense. And so when Jesus says to us things like, be generous, give your money away, we're thinking, how can we be rich and give our money away? How can we have what we need and be generous to other people? It doesn't make sense to us. That's what Jesus did. He taught things that that didn't make sense. And and when Jesus would say that we're to serve and we think, I I, I understand that, Jesus, and I would love to. And and if I have time, I'm going to get to that because I've got some other priorities. I've got some things. How can I fit that in? My job, my, my schedule, my family, all of these commitments that I have, and you want me to serve, and it, 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 it doesn't fit there. And Jesus says, that, just, just do this. I know it's, it, it's opposite of what you say, but, but just trust me, it works. And then we get down to that whole thing of trust and faith. Because you and I, we want to be in control, and Jesus says, I want you to take a risk. I want you intentionally to let go, to release. And we're like, I I don't like to do that. I I want to be in control of things. I want want to be able to touch. I want to be able to feel. And and you want me to have faith and, 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 and intentionally lose control of things, and it doesn't make sense to us. And Jesus' message again is, my kingdom is here. And it's completely different. You cannot put it in a box. And so Jesus' actions and his associations and even his teaching, completely out of the box, but maybe the thing that's most difficult for us, have to do with Jesus' expectations. Because they throw the box away completely. Because we have an idea of what we ought to do in response. We have an idea of what it means to to be a follower. We have an idea of what it means to do what someone says and to believe in someone. But Jesus throws it all out the window when he says, whoever wants to be my disciple, they have to deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. 
Jesus says, this, this is not anything that you just do that's half-hearted, that's a partial kind of a thing, that you just do it with a little bit of devotion. Jesus says, this is all about surrendering everything. You have to deny yourself completely. You have to take up your cross, which means you die to yourself, and you follow me, and it's not a one-time deal. This is a constant daily kind of a thing. And the people in Jesus' day weren't particularly interested in that. See, what the people were interested in Jesus' day was when he would do things for them. They loved the miracles. They loved the healings, more the healings. We like that, Jesus. They, they loved it when Jesus fed them. Jesus, we do, let's, let's just have another meal and, and you say some really good words again. We're all comfortable with that. We like that. But when he said things that were hard for them to follow, that's when people left. In fact, after Jesus fed the 5,000... After he broke bread and gave it to them, he said, I want you to know I'm the bread of life. And then he went on to say, unless you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you're not going to have a part of me. And the people heard that and they went, that's creepy and that's really dark and we're leaving now because we don't like what you're saying. And because of what Jesus said, because of what he taught, because of what he expected... There were followers that left him. Listen to what it says in John chapter 6. From this time, many of the disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? The issue is that as Jesus talked about his kingdom, people left. And so he turned to his 12 and he says, you want to leave too? He asked the 12 and Simon said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And it shows for us this choice that all of us have. Jesus, Jesus reveals Himself and comes out of the box completely and says, this is my kingdom, and this is what I'm all about, and there will always be some that will choose to reject Him. In fact, if we understand the Bible correctly, the majority are going to do that. And it's only those who choose to deny themselves and follow Him completely and say, God, to whom else, Jesus, to whom else shall we go? The problem is that you and I are an awful lot like the Jews of Jesus' day, the casual followers of Jesus' day. We like, we like all the blessings that Jesus brings. We like the good things that Jesus has for us. We like for Jesus to feed us, and we like for Jesus to provide for us, and we like for Jesus to heal us, and we like for Jesus to answer our prayers. We like the physical blessings, but we just kind of don't like the whole discipleship thing. I mean, I mean, all that hard work and all that stuff that's difficult to do. And the people of Jesus' day, like people of our day, they would prefer just to be in a casual, committed relationship. They're okay with believing in Jesus, and we want Jesus to be a part of our life, but we want to go on with life and do all the other things that we do. We like Jesus. We think He's a good guy. We've got this box where we can put Jesus in, and we like it when He stays right there. But we really don't want him seeping out and getting involved and messing up the other part of our lives. And Jesus calls for total devotion. That we give up all of our life. Jesus' message is this. My kingdom is here. And it's totally different. You know, this part of the story, this is the climax not the end, it's, it's just the climax because we've been leading up to this for centuries where finally the hero of the story is going to step in and here's the problem. The people that are there, they're completely missing it because they put the Messiah of God in a box. This is what it's going to look like. This is what he's going to do. This is what his kingdom is going to be. And they completely missed it. Most of you know that I went to uh, North Africa just this last week. And I want to show you a picture that I took while I was there. We've got workers that are in North Africa, people from our church. And we're uh, intentionally a little vague about where they are and what they do and who they work with. I'd share with you that uh, 
uh, more details in person. But uh, this is a picture from an overlook of the city that, that our people work with there. And as I'm looking, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded, and as I'm, 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 I'm watching this, just people going on doing life as normal. And, and it dawns on me that this is a city of 250,000 people. And as we talked with our workers there about how many Christians there are, they can count when we were there, maybe 25. Their team a few others that have come to Christ and believed in Jesus since they've been there, maybe one or two others. 25 people in a city of 250,000. And while this picture, from a photographer's standpoint, not a very good picture, yeah, I'm not a good picture taker anyway, there's a big shadow across there, but it became a little symbolic to me. Because as I'm looking over this city, there is this dark shadow that is cast across it because this is a city that only the smallest, only the smallest fraction of people have the light of Jesus there. And so that picture has become kind of a mental prayer tool for me of praying for, for the light of Jesus, for Jesus to shine in this city in North Africa. But then it dawned on me as I'm on a flight back and coming to the States. And as I looked here, people going about their business, just doing things without even knowing what they're missing. They, that they are missing the light of Jesus and they are going on with business. They don't know Him. And then it dawned on me, I'm not sure which is darker. Going to a place where just a minuscule amount of people know Jesus or coming home to a place where people know Jesus, but they don't follow Him with all their heart. They don't deny themselves and take up their cross like He asked. I'm not sure which is darker. Those that know, don't know Jesus and don't even know that they don't know Jesus, or those that know Him but refuse to follow Him completely. You know, we all create a box. And we all have... A box that we call my faith. Some people call it their religion, my faith life, whatever it is. And so we say this is what it looks like. And this is what I do. I, I go to church and I pray some and I do some good things and maybe I give some money and I, I, I do things that are comfortable for me and things that I prefer and I serve if it fits into my schedule, and I, 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 I love people you know, that are kind of like me, and I forgive people unless they do something really, really bad to hurt somebody in my family. And we come up with whatever it is that is kind of our box that we have created. But it's a far, far cry from what Jesus called us to do, and that is that we are to take up our cross, to die to ourselves, and to follow Him daily. I'm so glad Jesus didn't stay in boxes. He refused to. In fact, the last box they put him in a tomb, he showed his power and his kingdom rule by rising from the dead and emerging from that box. And what I'm praying is that we'll do away with the boxes that we've created for our picture of Jesus and for our picture of how we respond to him. I mean, this is... This is the story now about the hero of the story, Jesus. God's plan all along is to bring his people back to himself. That has been the pursuit of God throughout Scripture, is drawing people and using his people to draw his creation to himself. And now Jesus steps foot into this world and through his teaching and his actions remind us that this kingdom is like nothing we can imagine or that we can know or whatever. Jesus has come and Jesus is here and he's bringing us, he's bringing us to God. But Jesus says the people of his kingdom are the ones that make a choice. Are the ones that say, I will not just know Jesus, but I will follow him with all my life. Jesus' actions, his associations, his teachings, all out of the box. 
But don't miss this. Jesus' expectations for you are completely out of the box. Don't box in your response to him. Follow him with all your heart. Father, thank you for teaching us through your word today. Thank you for the reminder as we've walked through this story of your relentless pursuit of us and your desire to seek us and now sending your son Jesus into this world, drawing us to yourself and ultimately the story of him dying and and making us right before you because of that death and ultimately his resurrection. God, we thank you for giving everything so that we could know you. And God, we look forward to following you, choosing, committing ourselves to follow you fully all the days of our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.